You're listening to Shoe In, covering the ins and outs of all things footwear, from sneakers to heels, loafers to slippers, and every type of shoe in between. Brought to you by the FDRA, the footwear industry's association focused on retail, trade, politics, and fashion. Helping create and enhance conversations on all things footwear. And now your footwear insiders, Matt Priest and Andy Holt. Welcome to Shoe and Show Live. Yeah, Shoe and Show Live. It's awesome like- by Crunchy <laughs> Cheetos. <laughs> <laughs> and we're out. All right. And that's the show, folks. We've fulfilled our sponsorship obligation to <laughs> Cheetos. Chester Cheetos. Is that what his name? Chester? Chester Cheetah. Cheetah. Uh, yep. He's uh, not a puma. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> Jasmine. Jasmine. Look, don't let anyone know about us, okay? It's inside. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, welcome back to the Shoe and Show. Thanks so much for tuning in live. If you're not, uh, you might be watching this later. That's great. Fine. That's right. But you missed out on the ability to actually communicate with us live on screen, text in your questions. So if you do have questions, uh, there's a chat box there. You can type them in. Yep. Um, and we actually do have a guest today. <laughs> It's not just us talking as usual. I know. Answering about I know. the Polk and Priest pontification. <laughs> yeah, we do have a guest. And that's <laughs> Tiffany Beers, who's live with us from California. Tiffany's our footwear innovation advisor. She is an icon in the areas of footwear design, development, and now she's on the different greener pastures, but she's back here with us on Shoe and Show Live and in person. Pulling Tiffany, her back down into the muck. Welcome. Pulling her down into the muck in the mire. <laughs> Welcome, Tiffany. <laughs> Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I can't wait to hear, understand this conversation we're about to have. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. I feel like my wife says this every single night. I try to unpack what you're saying. You make no sense. That's what Please she's stop. saying to you? Please stop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly right. That makes sense. All right, so let's get right to it. We were talking about some of the things that we're seeing out there as, as it relates to innovations within our industry. And one company in particular seems to be firing on all cylinders they seem to be, just have a plan that's in place that's going to be impactful for to our industry. They have for a long time, but every once in a while they kind of they may lag a little bit just based on the sales of of the strength of sales of athletic footwear in particular. But Foot Locker is just making a lot of really interesting investments, Tiffany. And as someone who is at Nike and understands the athletic shoe business so well, what is your take on some of these investments, which we can go through one by one? But what's your take on it from the outset? Yeah, I think it's fascinating. I mean, this is definitely what I'm watching in the footwear world because this is a, this is innovation coming from a different place. Like, it's rare that you see a retailer investing in a shoe design school, right? Which you can see the indirect connection, but it's not a direct connection, right? So that's their investment in pencil. Yeah. And then you have the investment in uh, Super Heroic, which is Jason Maiden's brand, who was a designer at pencil, who does basically wants to promote play with kids. I mean, again, not a direct connection to Foot Locker, but those kids playing are going to buy those shoes, right? And then lastly, their investment in GOAT, which was the most surprising, and I think it's absolutely brilliant idea. I mean, to know exactly what's going in uh, and happening in the the kind of black market of shoes, uh, I think it's brilliant. And if they harness the data coming out of there, Oh, that's, I think they're going to be so far ahead of the retailers. And I actually think some of the retailers like Nike and Adidas uh, that are trying to drive uh, business to their websites are going to have to watch out for Foot Locker. That's really interesting. Can we and so, talk about what GOAT is? Yeah, greatest of all time. It's an acronym, um, it's an athletic acronym, but it's a, it's essentially a competitor to StockX. Am I, am I correct on that? Yeah, exactly. So they resell, basically resell shoes, and then they they do get some of their own um, lines and and product from from the various uh, brands. But yeah, basically, it's a resale market like StockX. And is there? I I just know StockX better because I've used it four or five times over my life. Is there one that's bigger than the other? Does I think it was a hundred million dollar investment from Foot Locker to Goat. Yes. I mean, which one Which one is the king right now? Will that $100 million do a lot to boost the GOAT brand itself? That I'm, I'm not sure which one's king right now. Um, I know they go back and forth because you have other players, right, like uh, Flight Club and Stadium Goods. Mm-hmm. So there's other players in this world, too, that are more brick-and-mortar retail. But I think GOAT having access to Foot Locker information and vice versa will probably bring GOAT to the top of the pile, but that 
that's just my guess. I think the interesting thing that Goat does on their website is they show you shoes like sort of the top sneakers that are under retail price. Um, so mm-hmm. like if you want it, you know, you you can find it under the retail price, which is kind of nice. I don't know that StockX, they show you what it is in comparison, but they don't kind of, Goat mm-hmm. just has a different filter they put everything through. That's interesting. I've seen this before. Have you? Where is that? Miracle on 34th Street, 1934 edition. Do tell. Walk where, us back. Well, it's where when they walked in and, the, and uh, the Santa Claus started telling them where they could go get a better deal. Yeah. And then George, and then Macy was like, that's the greatest Goodwill ambassador campaign we've ever seen. So they started making those books full of all the circulars. Uh-huh. And they would tell their customers where it was cheaper to get. And the customers were confused why they would do that. But it, it built a brand. That's right? what Santa like, does, man. He's a giving guy. So Goat apparently is the modern day 34th street they are christmas whatever well what's interesting about that analogy and is that in the modern day retail arena data is king i mean it seems to me that data is what's driving i mean nike's made a, a lot of investments in technology companies and data services in the ways in which we measure our how many miles we run versus how many twinkies i eat during a day it just seems like these companies are trying to figure out these big data mining opportunities to help excel their bottom lines yeah i think so i mean i think it's there's i remember when we first started looking at data a lot and and like there's always almost too much data right so knowing how to filter it into exactly what you need to to change your product or business, like that's key. And that's the, that's the really hard thing to do with it. I mean, it's like, it's like me saying like, go, if they can have actually a footlocker can have access to goat and understand how the prices fluctuate on a launch versus right after the launch, they could, they could just shift the retail product over to goat. Like if they know it's going to go over the sale of retail, it would make more sense for, for footlocker to shift all of that shoe, all that product to goat, sell it at a higher price. And then once it comes down, they just sell it in their retail. They so, it back. yeah, yeah. So it, um, it, there could be laws against that. Maybe I'm not. <laughs> I'm not a business no, person. Don't worry, don't worry about that afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, but this show is about ideas like that. I yeah. mean, I, I, and I think you're right. It's like figuring out the re, how to rechannel it. So there may be <laughs> rules in effect if they're doing something with Nike. Nike says you have to do this in brick and mortar to build it. But I mean, we're essentially talking about digital launches at this point full yeah. digital launches and some of that happens but the channels would be different right it wouldn't be on just nike's website it wouldn't just be on Foot Lockers. all of a sudden you've got this really cool hip side you know kind of website and the side brand that people are really looking at and interested in um but that also changes kind of the narrative of when you're we're talking about where we get our shoes from because matt will tell you if he goes to Foot Locker. He will tell me what the shoe it is because I don't know what it is generally. And then he'll tell me where he got it. I got it from Foot Locker. All right. I got that. Right. Maybe now Goat becomes that go-to source where people think it's super cool to go to Goat and buy things now. Right. So the branding's changing and morphing in different ways. Um, well, if you think about the audience, if the goal is to create an audience, one either in a grass from a grassroots perspective. So Nike launches the sneaker app. Uh, Foot Action has an app. Foot Locker has an app. And you develop it in that way, or you go out and buy it. And I think Foot Locker seems to have done both. They have their own app with drops and locations and information on footwear. But they clearly probably didn't have the mass that they thought they – the potential for the mass of customer base that they could develop just by going and investing in the GOAT group. And just so everyone knows, Flight Club is also part of the GOAT group. So it's – it's both of these channels that they've invested in. And Blake, I've got the goat the goat up right now under retail, where I'm actually looking at those. If you want to pull that up on the screen for uh, for people to take a look at, which is pretty cool. A lot of colorways, a ton of colorways on here. Very cool. You know, the, the, yeah, other, the interesting the, thing. Go ahead. No, you go ahead. Well, like goat does, like based on their featured searches, right? So if you scroll down their their main yep. page, like what everybody's yep. looking for, they categorize and populate it right there, which is super nice. So if you click on rust pink, which is a color, I'll right? Yep. You're gonna see the Air Jordan One Retro. That's thirty two hundred fifty dollars. Yep. I just bought it. Just bought it. <laughs> Ooh, that's gonna look good. Matt, can I get a raise? <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, Foot Locker never would have had access to that customer otherwise. And that's that's a completely different business. 
This is this this is the whole Amazon thing though too, right? So I'm going to tie in something completely outside our industry. I'm gonna, in two ways. One is Amazon. So when Amazon was going out and trying to figure out where they're going to put those warehouses, they were collecting information on all the localities, right? So they got their five and ten year plans and for infrastructure, for economic development, for challenges at localities. So they got that from like fifty different municipalities around the country. So all of a sudden they're going to know their transportation and supply chain issues down the road based on where the infrastructure investments are going. So even though they didn't place the warehouse in Austin, Texas, they, they know if Austin, Texas is building out infrastructure and how many trucks they may need there or how few trucks they may need there. And they can reorganize their supply chains and warehouses around that mentality and that data that they all have now. Right. The flip, the other side of that too is, is the recent announcement by McDonald's investing in a, personalization AI service where their boards, when you go up in the drive through are going to tag you and they're going to personalize product to what you order. So if you order a Big Mac meal, they will pop up on the screen, something that they have from your previous account have purchased and know it could be a great add on. And they're going to, they're going to boom their sales based on this personalization idea of the same thing that we're seeing here with goat. But imagine you go on there and it identifies who you are and it tells you like Russ Pink, so you don't go down to feature searches down the page. It pops up. It's like I know you like I, I know you like this, and I know you like that, and I know you like that. I'm going to combine all three. I'm going to give you up front. I'm yeah. going to sell you up front and get you right. Yeah. So this idea of where we're headed with, I don't know if it's AI exactly. They call it AI. I don't know if it's machine learning it's itself yet. Data but it's, manipulation. Yeah, it's personalization in in a very real way versus what we've talked about in the past, where it's like design your own shoe. Well, not everybody wants to design their own shoe. Some people want to be told what to buy and what's cool. Right. Yeah. So yeah, that's so true. Just my two thoughts. Well, Hey Tiffany, let me ask you this kind of parlaying off of that in general, <laughs> I ask this from a general perspective. perspective. When you're in the product development stage, are you being fed data on current trends on consumer behaviors? What are there? Are there silos for how a company distributes data in general, throughout its company to people in product development, marketing, sales, real estate, compliance, or or is it something that is is data driving all the decisions within a, a major footwear brand these days? How does that all work? Yeah, you know, I, I'm sure it's changed a lot since I've been there. Um, I think in general, data drives more decisions today than it did five years ago. But I also think people have seen the data and maybe data, just like everything else. I actually read this article. I I can't remember where it's from, but data can be interpreted in any direction. Like unless data is definitive Mm. or um, statistically significant, which are very specific measures for those things, it can be, you know, people generally take out the data to back their decision. Right. And they manipulate it. Right. Right. And so it's not like a pure thing. Like a lot of people think data is just factual. It's pure. It's very not pure. Right. So um, I think it drives a lot more decisions today, but it's a, the all about how you filter it and the amount of time it takes. I think in the front end of product development, um, if you have data from customers, you know, like think of Amazon reviews, that's a probably is the best mm easiest way to look at data right now. Like if you look at your reviews, you average the percentage and then you look at the comments of like the one star reviews and you either decide to take each of those comments individually or you take them as a collective. But either way of using that data could negatively or positively impact that product development. So I'm not convinced that it's the right thing to do. You know, I'm more of the the mindset that someone has an idea and they've seen it being, they've seen a problem that an athlete, for example, has, and they have a solution that's just super intuitive and really works, simplifies their issue and takes their problem away. That's not data driven. It's just creative problem solving. That's anecdotal driven, ultimately. 
Yeah. So yeah, there is actually not a filter button for idiots on Amazon, so we can't no. actually filter out the idiots that do leave reviews. No, you which can't. Are many. Well, that's true for just about every single <laughs> communication platform on the internet, um, whether it's a social media platform or a, a retail. Or the buying emails come in at info at fdr.org. Yeah, we, way, uh, <laughs> you know. What monkey is manning that? Asking us to, do, to be their distribution channel in the United States. Yeah, we do not do that, folks. Yeah, exactly. Again, exactly. Again. Stop with it from Bangladesh. We know who you are. Yeah, exactly. So let's let's pivot from technology, Tiffany, to talk about we were before we came on, we were talking about renewable materials for uppers and whether or not that's played out at this point. And not in the sense that people aren't still exploring, not in the sense that people aren't still doing R and D about renewable materials and the use of them. I'm I'm wearing actually a pair of Sperry's that are that take in five recycled bottles and they make the the upper out of, of recycled plastic. So it's it's even permeating beyond the athletic space. Um, but it hasn't gotten to the mass level, right? We're not generating, we're not selling these things at Target, Walmart, and Kohl's. So kind of what's are we stalled out on it, or is it we're just waiting for kind of the next big, the next big invention to come about for us to get excited about it again? Yeah, I think it's complicated. I think it's an easy story to tell right now, but I think there's some media fatigue on it, right? Like, here's another renewable material. Here's how my gum is used. Here's how corn is used, right? But at the end of the day, those materials are still expensive. They're mm-hmm. still harder to work with. And the lower price point products, just they, they can't use them yet. So that becomes a problem. But at the end of the day, you still have the end of life issue, right? If there's 25 billion pairs of shoes made every year, how are we recycling all those? And that is way more critical today than using corn or using a renewable material. So I would love, I would love to see shoes that like, they tell you how to take it apart so you can recycle it. Um, and so that you can dispose of it. Cause some of the materials are, are recyclable. Um, but there's also brands like there's, there's a level of development that still needs to take place in some of those materials before they're ready for maybe prime time. And that, that includes cost reduction, right? Yeah. And it also includes durability. So like Mycoworks, this is one of my favorite ones to watch. They do the mushroom leather. Yeah, I've seen and that. So, yeah, a few months ago when I first looked at them, they had it down to they could make a hide of leather as big as a cow hide in two weeks, right, where the leather hide is – two years Uh and it was as durable as deer skin. So now they have it to a bunch of different durability levels and they actually can grow patterns on it. And it's like, this material is going to take over the world to be honest. Uh Uh, So, so, but they're still right. It's still expensive. It's still not that accessible. You know, you're not going to see a Coles, you know, shoes made out of that in the next two years, but hopefully thereafter. But but you're bullish overall in the technology and the material itself as a as a usable material for footwear uppers. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I I think so. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that is interesting. That's better than my idea. Barbecue shoes? No, I'm on. I'm you're off. You pass that. Which one are we on now? Uh, I want to actually create a shoe that zips the upper to the foam, so you can unzip the foam when it runs out, and you can recycle it. And you just take a whole new foam and zip it back on there. Put it in you there. You can change out the colors as you want to. There you go. You wash the fabric on top. It's easier to wash it than put the you know the foam. Doo-doom, 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 you know, you try oh, yeah, to dry yeah, yeah. it. Yeah. It drives me crazy. Well, I hate it, but I think it's already out there. Uh oh, snap! Like What's it called? I hope they trademark that. <laughs> What's it called? IP wars. What's it called? I can't remember. I have to look it up. But it's on one of the crowds. you. Ones. Wow. And there's, I think there's IP on it too. Uh, of course, it is. <laughs> after the fact, man. That, I'm sorry, you have to. Keep I'm gonna your walk down job. to the USPTO and just start asking. Just start filing, <laughs> filing, right. patents, filing everything. See what happens? Everything, <laughs> everything. Mm-hmm. Start with barbecue shoes. I like that one. Yeah. No so. one else is gonna touch that. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you put some sauce on it. <laughs> um, well, uh, it's called Zips. Z I P Z. Z I P Z. That's like cool cigarettes with a K. <laughs> How creative. C-I-P-C. Uh, the other thing we were talking about, too, were robotics, right? So we think about and, – and I mean, I've been thinking the last year just on, like, new workforce issues. Because when I think of innovation, I think – you know, we're talking about the data part of it. And I think part of your, 
you're dead on when you talk about like making sense of it and being wise, right? It's not just being smart about what the data is. It's being wise about what it means and where it's headed. And so when I think of innovation, I think three and five years down the road, like you're trying to solve a problem ahead of time to meet when the market really is going to hit it, right? That's right. really successful innovation is knowing where the market's heading and and innovating to that point and then yep. executing right then and there, right? That's successful. And so um, – Anyway, I, I just think it, there's so many things happening and trying to unpack it all. But uh, with with workforce development and issues like that, we're now hitting the point where we keep saying, like, machines are going to take people's jobs. They're already taking the jobs, but they're not jobs people necessarily want to do. So there's a recent announcement where Walmart is actually rolling out a whole line of robots to clean the store floors. Right. And while they're doing that, they're scanning the shelves to see what – was taken off of what might need to be restocked to feed back into the inventory levels to go ahead and get it ordered or mm-hmm. have the stock boy or woman go go ahead and put it back up there. And so it's not – in that sense, it's not like a threat, right? Like people would rather be a barista at Starbucks and get good benefits than like clean up on aisle four, right? Right. So there's the, the, these robotic things happening and, and I don't think it's going to end. I think it will we'll keep figuring out what jobs people don't want. And we'll solve it through automation in that sense. And I don't think it's a direct threat to people on the front lines engaging people face to face. If you go into a store, you still want to see someone interact, I think. Some people do. Millennials don't, but some people do. I don't know. (laughs) I mean, I think that's true. I mean, Tiffany, when you think about machine assisted learning, machine assisted careers, one of the biggest job killers we talk about in this country has not been trade, which was kind of our our wheelhouse, but it has been efficiencies, robotics, those kinds of things. What is kind of, as you think about the American workforce and then the, the footwear workforce or even the tech workforce that you're in now, how is technology both a threat, but what is it more an opportunity to take to kind of do those jobs that we're having trouble finding people to do in all honesty? Yeah, this is this is a fascinating conversation. You know, I I got a plastics engineering degree, so injection molding was a big part of what I learned and did in my early career. And that was in the you know late '90s, early 2000s when it became cheaper to build molds in China. Yeah, and so yeah. like that was very threatening at the time. And so you kind of look at it. Um, I think it's really interesting. Like I get that people don't want to do certain jobs like cleaning the floors at Walmart and things like that. But at the same time, you have people obsessing in the footwear world about cleaning shoes. Mm. So now you can literally, you know, this is so weird, but people used to clean shoes, right? Do shoe shine all the time. But that was you usually like a dress shoe or something. Yeah. But now you can send your shoes like to go. You can send them to go and they pay people to hand clean your shoes meticulously. Really? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm actually going to go get my shoes clean. So <laughs> <laughs> they got me. <laughs> when? We should we should follow the process. Uh, well, they have yeah. them at the malls now. Um, and on my way home, I always pass Pentagon City Mall yeah. um, in Arlington. And I have a pair of 11s that <clears throat> I wore just before like the icy soles started to turn colors. But it's like on the edge. So I want them to reverse it back so it can just be <laughs> completely clean. Um, so I'm going. <laughs> I'm going to pay the money. <laughs> I'll clean it for you, Jasmine. Mm. I don't know if you have the skill set. <laughs> yeah, so I think I think it's um it's interesting, right? Because it comes back to like for some reason cleaning sneakers now is popular. Yeah. It was a need that people had that wasn't being addressed and now you have there's four or five brands in the market that are just taking over in that respect. So I think that's interesting. And then I think robotics is, you know, here's the thing about robotics. You have to know how to do what you want it to do to program it. Yeah. Right. right. Like yep. someone has already had to do it. Right. Until AI gets further. Once, of course, there's this vision of AI being able to just intelligently know everything. But I think we're pretty far off on that. Yeah. But I think robotics, like monotonous tasks that you need to be done exactly the same and they're critical to a product. Yeah. I'm all for robots doing those. Um, I think it's the best value you can add. And you know, some of these renewable materials, right. They rely on nature to grow them. Right. Right. But what if they actually had, um, a different system of making them, you know, you think of like a knitting machine where the machine just runs and runs and runs versus someone knitting that. Right. Right. So, 
you, you have a lot of different dynamics with the robotics and technology. I think for sure it will optimize things and we'll find people doing cooler and cooler jobs uh, because of the robotics that, that starts to get implemented. But I don't know. I don't know about you guys, but once I start, I notice a lot nowadays, I type a lot. Like I don't write with my hand anymore. And there's something about that tactile writing yep, yep. that I love and it just satisfies me for some reason. And if I don't write, I find myself just drawing circles on things, uh-huh. just mm-hmm. circles, the act of writing. So I think there's something like we're humans maybe are made to work with our hands a little bit more. They uh, are. So- I agree with that. I mean, I, I talk to people about uh, the difference between reading content on your laptop versus the newspaper in the morning. There's something there's something psychological about holding something. Your your mind grasps what is right. said so much more when there's something physical that you're doing with it. Um, and that's the big concern with my kids. Um, and I've, my wife and I've talked about this is um, it's kind of a lost art of not even so much cursive that's writing, but just writing in schools and practicing and drawing and shapes. And, and so there, you know, we, we purposely tried to put her in a program that focuses on those things. Right. Yeah. Because the cognition builds upon things, right. You can't just skip, those steps and go straight to something digital. There's something missed along the way that you cognitively need, I think, to be creative or to to think about things more critically. Well, know? that's why the studies are coming out that kids, little kids that get iPads <laughs> out the gate and they're on them a lot or any screen time, TVs, right. old school TV too, are not nearly as as intellectually developed right. as kids that do read and craft. Um, study, play outside. We all also the see this in soccer, about. if I if I may. Soccer, yeah. If you have a, a an American <laughs> person that that plays soccer and they go through college and they get a contract in Europe and they go to Europe to play, American sports up to that point don't fe- don't focus on the technicalities of the play, right? Mm-hmm. So the technical details, repetitive notions, learning all the different systems, they go over there and they're completely lost and they're oftentimes not successful because they don't learn the basics of repetitive motions and plays and tactics and mm-hmm. things like that. And so they often have to come back to like Landon Donovan had that problem. He comes back to the Col- back to the Colorado <laughs> Rapids you go. There you go. So. <laughs> that's yeah. fascinating cuz that's like um like in footwear right everyone thinks they can be a designer. Everyone can draw a picture of a shoe. Mm-hmm. But the reality is to designing shoes it's way more complex. Like you have to feel that in hand you have to actually make parts of it to really understand how to do it yeah there's something there that you can't just skip steps yeah you can't skip foundations right it's just not how things work and technology that we have today when everybody's like oh that's a huge advance it's like well that's built on something else right right that didn't just come out of nowhere that somebody just invented this thing or this code or whatever it's like Oh no, that, that code was built on C plus plus and then it goes to Java and then it goes so coding and all these things that our economies are built on don't just don't just come out of left field. Right. Right? Like it's just I mean It's not like mushroom leather. The people iPhone that grows. the iPhone came from Star Trek, okay. Is that where it came from? Yeah. It came from- there was like a thing on Star Trek where they were like talking about, you know, beam up all these communication devices. Yeah. There you go. Sci fi. Sci fi is where it's at. Somewhere. All the nerds were right. All the nerds were right. <laughs> Even Cheetos, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, Chester. <laughs> there Chester's, had to be a chip first. Yeah. yeah, Chester's in style because he's wearing a thick, thick white uh, dad sneaker. Yeah, nice. As he goes around, if you take a look at that, it's yeah, very interesting. It's like a slipper. I don't even know if it has any traction. He looks like he's doing. They're self lacing because he's <laughs> too busy. So he's like, no, here's the deal, right? They're white. His fingers are super cheesy because he's eating Cheetos all the time, so he can't lace his shoes. So they're self lacing just yeah, by they logic. Must be. Self lacing or self lazy? Tell me. Both like of the them. First mm. version of Uggs over there. Kind of. First version. <laughs> 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 Well, uh, Tiffany, this has been awesome. We can't yeah, thank, thank you enough you for, joining. for beaming in over this technology that no, appeared no, no, out of no, left no, no, field no, no, no. off Star Trek <laughs> to be with us. We really appreciate it. Sure, my pleasure. Awesome. Well, folks, uh, that's just a discussion on certain innovations that are happening. What I really like is not just talking about what's happening in our industry. There's so many things outside our industry that, that impact and they get pulled in, right? Yep. I often think footwear is not a leader in a lot of innovations per se. Uh, when it comes to retail and things like that, but we we pull it in from other places, so it's always good to 
to branch out and see what people are doing and then how people are bringing that in to our industry. Um, we've seen that on design from like aircrafts. Yep. And, you know, the first people doing CAD design were aircrafts 30 years ago. And all of a sudden now everybody's like, well, CAD design print is like, well, they were designing aircrafts 30 years ago yeah, and bolts CADs. and things. So mm-hmm. it's, it's important that we broaden our, our purview to see all these different things happening um, in our economy and in our world and kind of pull that back to see what, what's happening in our um, in our one little corner of the world. Yep. Uh, folks, Shoe and Show, you can find us at show.com. We're on Twitter. We're on Facebook. Drop us a line. Uh, drop us comments on this show. No dumb comments. We will filter those out, unlike Amazon. Um, uh, but if you have ideas for topics for, for show guests, let us know. Um, this is your podcast, the Footwear Industry Podcast, and we want to hear from you and make sure that we're delivering content that's valuable to your daily workload. Um, and we hope you found today very interesting, thoughtful. Um, hopefully, uh, you'll listen to this and you'll get some some gears churning inside your head. And you'll start drawing circles on pieces of paper. <laughs> so until next time, Shoe In is out. Shoe In has been brought to you by the FDRA, the Footwear Industries Association focused on retail, trade, politics, and fashion helping create and enhance conversations on all things footwear. For information about FDRA, visit FDRA.org.